Well, welcome back to what every service pro should know about people. And now we want to take a look at why guests don't come back and what you can do about it. The goals in, in this session are to help you get a new perspective on this whole process of guest satisfaction, to understand why somebody has a good time and why they don't. And also to help you understand those things that you can do to influence as a guest mood for, for better or for worse. There's a lot of very innocent mistakes that we make on, on every shift that can cause people to be the path to the competitors. See, the high-tech secret, this is, this is really inside stuff now, guys. The high-tech cutting-edge secret, how you make big bucks in the hospitality business, is only that. No unhappy guests. The only reason that the restaurant exists is to make sure that the people that you serve are thrilled by what you do for them. Because if you got folks walking out the door and they're not excited about what happened inside your four walls, it doesn't matter what your check average is or your snappy new uniforms or anything else. You got a problem. You got a big problem. Because none of us operate in a market that's big enough that we can afford to let anybody get away. So I want to give you a, a, a quick idea here when we talk about why people feel served. And I think it's, it's an important distinction between you feeling served and me serving you. It's the problem with saying, you know, going out there and saying, well, give them good service because I can define good service from my perspective. Did you give them good service? Yes, I did. Well, why are they complaining? Why haven't they been back? Why do we have a problem? My suggestion is that you want to go out there and make sure your guests are delighted. Because I can't define delight from my side. If I want to see about delight, I have to get into your experience and see how things are working for you. And that puts the focus in the right place. So I want to give you a little bit of a model here to maybe help you understand this a little bit. And I'm, when I'm talking about higher and lower, what I'm talking about is your mood, your state of mind, uh, your level of well-being. And the nice thing about restaurants is people come into restaurants, for the most part, expecting to have a good time. I mean, we have a distinct advantage over the IRS <laughs> or the post office or places like that. And when people come in in a good mood, they're very forgiving. If something goes wrong, it's, hey, no big deal. You know, they're very generous. They spend money well. Food tastes terrific. You know, make a suggestion to somebody when they're in a good mood, and, hey, that really sounds good. I mean, they tip well. They tell their friends. All those things that we want to happen will happen pretty much automatically when folks are in a good mood. Would you agree? But, of course, it doesn't always go right, and there are little snags and little glitches and little minor irritations, and nothing's really big, but every one of them is kind of like a weight on a balloon. Every one of them kind of brings the mood down, and as people get into a lower state of mind, they start to access different kinds of thoughts. They become a lot more negative. They become a lot more critical. Do you ever have a night when people are sending the food back and the food's fine? You know, the only thing that happened, we just got caught down here someplace. It's like when you're sick, food's just not interesting. It's not about whether it's good or bad. It just doesn't appeal to me. Make a suggestion to somebody when they're in a low mood, it's pushy salesmanship. People can be extremely rude. Another way to think about it is a high state of mind is kind of like being in love. A low state of mind is like having a really bad day. I mean, think about this thing. You're in love. You're driving to work. I'm in the car right behind you having a really bad day. You think we might have a different experience of the traffic? What changes about the traffic? It's the same traffic. You're in a great mood. I'm in a terrible mood. We go to dinner together. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? You think we might have a different experience of exactly the same meal? You think we might leave a different tip to a server who's done precisely the same thing for both of us? And that's my point here, is that the world doesn't change, but how it looks to people changes based on kind of where their eyeballs are. And, and, and the problem is the worse it gets, the worse it gets. Here's an example of what I mean by that. For a lot of people, bright red nail polish on the hands of a server bothers them. Some people don't notice, but for some folks that's a big deal. But if you went out to dinner and the only thing that happened was the server had red nail polish, well, probably not a big deal. 
But let's say that you called the place up and you got a hold of somebody in the kitchen and they drop the phone two or three times and they put you on hold for 10 minutes and you finally get directions to the place and the directions are wrong. So you drive around in the rain and for 45 minutes, you finally find the joint, your car bottoms out in a pothole in the parking lot on the way in, the lobby's full of dirt and leaves that uh, have blown in, the greeter's on the phone chewing gum, talking to a girlfriend on the phone who kind of waves you off to a table in the middle of the dining room that's under a harsh light with a draft and the duct tape on the carpet and the tabletop is wobbly and there's a burn hole in the linen and a coffee stain on the menu and the salt and pepper shakers are greasy and the server comes over with their bright red nail polish and hands you a glass of water. <laughs> At that point, red nail polish is a big deal. I mean, in that case, I don't even know why somebody would have come. I, I would have been calling for a pizza long before that. But even if they showed up, they're spoiling for a fight from the time they walk in the door. And you will work your buns off on that table. They're going to stiff you on a tip, leave and tell their friends, don't waste your time there. So let's take a look at what some more of those things are that sort of lower the mood and put people down into a place where they uh, have a bad time. You get a few cartoons in this part, so, so it's kind of good. I'm sorry, we're all out of, all out of menus. going to get you something else. So a few first impressions. Talking on the phone when you're trying to deal with a guest at the same time always makes me feel real important. How about that warm, friendly restaurant greeting, too? Smoking or non? <laughs> I don't even know what a non is. I guess we got them, people ask. But this doesn't work as well with somebody by themselves. Somebody by themselves, you say, is, is there anyone else joining you? And they go, no, no, there is. <laughs> oh, true story. Friend of mine, upscale hotel, Colorado, maitre d' at the door in a tux. This buddy of mine walked up, by in the, you know, maitre d' looked at him and said, what, no date? <laughs> oh, knife in the heart. Somebody by themselves, you might say, are you ready to be seated? But just think about it. Just think about it. And don't say the same thing to everybody that walks in, because no matter how good it is, after a while it's going to sound canned. Do you ever walk into a restaurant and have no one around? Or get seated at a table and then wait and wait and wait and wait? You've got about 30 seconds from the time they walk in the door, and it should happen faster than that, to let them know that you know that they're there. Sometimes you can't get to them, but if you at least make eye contact and acknowledge them, people will wait quietly. They won't have a problem. But it doesn't work as well at the table. When people get seated at your station, you've got about 60 seconds to get to that table, stop, Never talk to a table while you're moving, because if you talk to a table while you're moving, the message is, i got something happening right now that's more important than you are. So you get to the table, stop, make eye contact, say, hey, I'm really glad to have you here. I'm right in the middle of something right now. I'll be, be with you in just a second. And that'll take you, what, three, four seconds to say? If you can't, then go do what you have to do. If you can't get back to the table and start service within three minutes, Get help, because you can't go back and reset that clock again. This is also the case for a smaller station, and some of you probably have had the experience of taking home more tips off a small station than you will off a large station, and that's because we have the time for the personal connection and to be with people when they're there. I love this cartoon. It said, hi there, folks. My name is John. I'm estranged from my father. My girlfriend may be pregnant. I'm up to my years in debt, and I'll be your waiter tonight. And they say, what are the specials? <laughs> you see, because the sad truth of it is people are singularly uninterested in your life story. I mean, if they ask, that's fine. But unless you're trying to get adopted, you know, my suggestion at the table is exactly the same thing as at the front door. Cut to the chase. Hey, we're glad to have you here. Got some interesting things going on tonight. Don't introduce yourself when you first get to the table, because frankly, when you, get to the, when you first get to the table, I don't know you well enough to care who you are. I'm sorry. If you want to leave your name, and I'm all for leaving your name, because that's part of personal connection, leave it at the end. So after you've talked about the specials and so forth, say, by the way, my name's Bill. If there's any problems, just stand up in your chair and yell, help, and I'll, take, I'll be right over to take care of it. <laughs> 
something like that. Okay, let's look at this thing. Running out of anything. Now, I've been around this business since I was 14 years old, and I know that if we're doing it right, we don't always have everything that the menu says we have, right? But when you run out of something, that's poor management. And when you sell out of something, that's a popular item. And you see it. Well, we're just playing with words here, and maybe we are. But look at it from its impact on your guest. Because you know somebody's going to order the sea bass, and they say, yeah, we ran out of that. And? <laughs> Is there more? So, you know, we sold out of that. We get that in fresh. It seemed like tonight everybody wanted it. Let me suggest an alternative for you. And then if it's something that's regularly on the menu, you might say, normally if you get here before 6 o'clock, we almost always have that. If it's something that's not regular on your menu, though, there's a great opportunity. You can say, if you really like that, leave me your name and phone number. Next time we have it on, I'll save you some and give you a call. Check that out. Your competitors aren't going to do that. Repeating every item as the guest order, this is... Uh, Airlines do it all the time. It kind of drives me nuts. But what it sounds like is this. The guest says, well, I like a club sandwich. Go club sandwich with uh, French fries. French fries? And uh, coleslaw. Coleslaw? <laughs> and it's that echo effect that's just incredibly annoying. I mean, if you have a question about what somebody ordered, by all means, repeat it back to them, but do it at the end. And say, okay, let me make sure that I have this right. You wanted the club sandwich with the devout. Okay. And pointing in the dining room, because pointing in the dining room is usually an answer to the question of where are the restrooms, where are the washrooms. And for a lot of people, this is incredibly embarrassing. I mean, we all use restrooms. We don't want anyone else to know we do. I, I've never totally understood that. But it is embarrassing for some folks, because it's like, ah, I know where you're going. So the best answer to where are the restrooms is let me show you. The next best answer is find a way to describe how to get there that doesn't look like you're parking an airplane. It's under the green pinata to the left of the bar or whatever. Understand, too, that people who ask directions to the restrooms are probably first-time guests because your regulars already know where the facilities are. And if you've got somebody who's with you for the first time, it's because somebody else let them get away. And I tell you what, if they get away from your place and get to my place, you'll never see them again because that's my job. And so if you have someone who's a first-time guest, get that information to the manager at the, on, on duty. Get that information to the server at the table because I want to make sure that you have such an absolutely marvelous time that you never, ever want to go anyplace else again. But if you go to the table and say, gee, I understand this is your first time here, and they say, how did you know that? Don't tell them about the restroom thing. <laughs> they don't understand that part. Operating your mouth without engaging your brain. I'm sorry, it's not my table. <laughs> Things that we say that get us in trouble. Who gets what? I mean, this is it's our job to know who gets what, guys. If you can't do that, you end up with what I call the food auction. So you show up at the table and say, okay, i got a club sandwich here. Wants, okay, good, club sandwich in the back. It's Bush League. It's our job to know that. That means table numbers. That means seat numbers. That's every check, every time. Everybody, anybody in the place should be able to pick up a tray of anything and take it to the table and know who gets what. Or you tell a guest we're running a little behind tonight. And your point is what? You've got to understand that giving people a reason that you're screwing up their meal is not the same thing as fixing it. If you're running a little bit behind tonight, yes, you have to let a guest know, but then you also have to make some gestures. Say, it's taking a little bit longer than usual tonight. Let me bring you another glass of wine on us while you wait. Let me bring you an appetizer. Just, just having an excuse for giving bad service doesn't make it good service. So you go to the table to check back, and you say, how's everything? And the answer to how's everything is fine. It's like, how are you? Fine. You know, it's a, it's a totally mindless question. You don't have to turn on your brain to ask it. I don't have to turn on my brain to answer it. And all we do is make noise at each other. And what I'm, all I'm suggesting here is ask a little better question than that. Uh, what did you think about the sauce on the salmon? You know, did you like the way that the... Uh, the fish was prepared, something like that. Because if you have to think before you open your mouth, you have to drop distractions and show up. Now you're here. 
And if the guests can't answer it on automatic, they have to drop distractions and show up. Now they're here. Now we're both here. And the odds are a lot better of us connecting if you're here and I'm here than if you're on automatic and I'm on automatic. So just think about what you're saying. And, and I hope you never say this. How are you guys doing tonight? I mean, first of all, it's, you know, if they're women at the table, it's rude. But the truth of it is, how I'm doing tonight is none of your business. I don't know you well enough. If we have a relationship, I mean, if we've known each other prior to this, asking how you're doing is fine. But if you don't know me and you ask me a question like that, I'll give you medical history. You say, how are you doing tonight? I say, well, my back. You know, the weather gets this way, and then I think people are thinking, oh, it's a weirdo. Cut to the chase. I mean, why take a chance? Hey, we're really glad to have you here. Got a couple of interesting things going on that you'd like, like to know about. And just get into it. This is just a noise that you make when you get to the table, and it doesn't advance the cause at all. Having pieces of the broken cork floating in the wine sort of takes the edge off a romantic evening. <laughs> food and beverage type things. They're like hot food that's not and cold food that, that isn't. This is just, this is, if there's anything basic in this business, it's got to be hot food, hot and cold food, cold, and most people don't do it. And it's just a question of physics. If you want cold food, cold, you have to put it on a plate that is colder than the food. Don't put anything wet on a plate that's just out of the freezer because it'll freeze to it, salads particularly. And if you want hot food hot, that means that those plates have to be 250, 300 degrees. That means you keep them in an oven. If you really have a plate, a plate that's hot enough to keep food hot, it's too hot to bare hand. And if you can actually serve hot food hot, you've got a point of difference. Because when you present it, you can say, watch out, not only is that plate hot, but that food's hot, too, and not many places do that for you anymore. And when they go to their competitors and get that, uh, get that warm food on the cold plate, who are they going to think of? Specials ought to be special. I mean, this is not a place to get rid of leftovers. That's why God invented soup. <laughs> let's, do a, let's do something good. How about that frozen butter that shreds the bread? Don't you just love that? And those stupid little lemon slices that you can't squeeze, what do you do with those silly little things? I mean, you've, I mean, if you want to, if you iced tea, you know, if you want lemon in your iced tea, give them a wedge of lemon. At least it's something that you can do something with. Then you all know that 12-hour coffee. You know, we'll make a fresh pot when this pot's gone and not a moment before. <laughs> and if we don't sell it, we'll pay to the parking lot with it. If you have pot, if you have coffee in one of those glass carafes, you've got about a half an hour before it starts to turn to sludge. And, and coffee is so incredibly important because it's the last experience that most people have of the meal. And if the coffee is terrible, it colors everything else that you've done all night. So just things to think about. I mean, what other things might be going on in your restaurant that might lower the mood of the guests? Think about that. You might want to pause here and just have a discussion about this. I mean, I put a list together. I've got about uh, a thousand things in a book that I did called Restaurant Basics, and I've found four or five hundred more since I did that. I mean, there's no end to little distractions that just get in people's way. I've got to give you my salad bar cartoon. I just love this one. Please use tongs. So we talked about a lot of things that, that can bring the mood down. How about a few things that can bring the mood up? There's a few of those, too. Smiling eye contact, for sure. Look at me, smile at me, talk to me, thank me. Mike Hurst, a brilliant restaurateur in, in Florida, had a seafood restaurant, and one of the things he would tell his servers to do is go to the table and recommend the fish you think they most look like. And people would go to the table with this big, silly grin on their face, and the guests loved it, and they never knew. Uh, <laughs> reinforcing people's decisions. See, when people make a decision, they're very vulnerable because nobody wants to make a mistake. I mean, imagine that you go to a restaurant, you order the prime rib, the waiter rolls his eyes and starts laughing. <laughs> prime rib, huh? You're real sure. You go, <clears throat> what I do? If they order your favorite, tell them that that's your favorite. If it looks really good tonight, tell them that. If, you know, what do you want to have when you get off your shift? I mean, the least you can say, oh, you're really going to like that. Because what you're saying is, you've done good. And they go, I've done good. 
And when people, and again, keeps people in a good mood. I mean, if you embarrass me over the entree, do not expect me to take a chance with the dessert. This is a very subtle uh, kind of an improvement of service, but it can be really important. And that's bring the full one before you take the empty one away. And here's what that looks like. Let's say that you've got a basket of rolls at the table. There's and and the roll basket is is getting empty. There's one level of service where the guest sees that the rolls are are empty, and it's a uh, waiter. There's another level of service where you see that they need more rolls. You take the roll basket away, and you bring back the full one. And that's that's not bad, except that for a period of time there, there's a hole on the table where that basket used to be. So you've you've diminished them. You've taken something away from them. Much higher level of service. I bring you the full basket, and then I take the empty one away. I bring you the, the fresh drink, and then take the empty glass away. So I'm never leaving you without. And, and it is a higher level of service. We talked in, in a previous section of this thing about the idea that you really are kind of an independent business person and with a four- or five-table restaurant to run. And is it safe to say that your ability to run your four- or five-table restaurant has some relationship to the amount of cooperation you get from the cooks in the kitchen? Duh. <laughs> and this is going to be news to you, but I, I've got this on very good authority, that cooks, in fact, are people too. Startling. And you've got people back there. These guys are putting out some incredible product under some very extreme conditions of heat and pressure and all the rest of it. And if the only time they ever hear from you is when there's a problem, what do you think happens to their mood? And as their mood goes down, what do you think happens to their eagerness to accommodate the special request from those prima donnas in the dining room? If people are loving the food, you've got to tell them that people are loving the food. Oh, you've got to watch it. I mean, don't break their concentration, but pass the good news back there. And if they do a favor for you, thank them, and thank them, in per thank them personally. See, because it's about personal relationships back there, too. This is, this is another little one, but my wife's left-handed, and she's always moving things over to the left side because that's kind of the way things work for her. <laughs> we had a waiter one night and kept moving it all back. I thought that was kind of interesting. But she said she really appreciates it when somebody recognizes that she's left-handed, and when they bring the coffee, they bring it on the left side. And it's just one of those little, oh, you noticed. And it's a, it's a personal touch. It's tiny, but it's huge to the person that you do it for. Another thing that you can do, speaking in complete sentences, we get it, we get a lot into shorthand. Rolls, coffee, and I, I don't mean the soliloquy from Hamlet here or anything like that, but just one or two more words to make it into a complete sentence. Would you like coffee? Could I bring you fresh rolls? Because what happens is you have to think before you open your mouth. And if you think, if you have to think before you open your mouth, you drop distractions and show up. And the guest perception is much higher level of service, which, in fact, it is. If you've ever gone out to eat with little kids, you know that you've got to clean them up before the meal, you've got to clean them up after the meal. And mom probably has all this stuff with her. I mean, most baby bags I've seen will support a small country for several months. But it's just the idea of bringing some wet naps or, or, a, or a damp towel so they can clean the kids off uh, before the meal starts. It's just one of those, oh, that's so nice. Any of you take cream and sugar in your coffee? You know what it's like when you get it fixed just the way you like it? It's absolutely perfect. Here comes some bozo, tops the coffee off, and blows the whole chemistry on you. <laughs> if you have a drink that people doctor up to taste, and, and iced tea can be the same way, just get permission before you do that. Just make eye contact, and if they've got it just the way they want it, they'll let you know. My wife has sensitive teeth. She, uh, she'll put an uh, ice cube in a, in a cup of coffee to bring it down to the right temperature. You fill it up with hot coffee, well, we're back to step one again. And if coffee's been sitting for a while, bring a fresh cup. Because topping off a half a cup of cold coffee gives you a, a full cup of lukewarm coffee. And that's a terrible way to end the meal. And if you're going to do it, you might as well get the points for it. Either... Bring the pot to the table with a fresh cup or bring the cup filled. It depends on how the service works in your restaurant. And just say, you know, I, I saw that uh, this coffee's been sitting for a while. I thought you'd appreciate a fresh cup. 
Because what you're saying to them really is, I did this just for you. And that's part of that personal connection that makes them feel better, also helps with your tip. And also like the idea of garnishing the doggy bag. Uh, put something in there that they didn't expect. Maybe a little extra sauce with the pasta. Put in some tortilla chips or a cookie or something. Talk to your management about that. I mean, it doesn't help you tonight, but when they get home and they open the doggy bag or the doggy box or whatever you've got for them, it's like, oh, this is interesting. And it's part of that delight because we're really into wow. I mean, they, if, they, if they're not saying wow at least two or three times during the meal, then we've got work to do. I mentioned this book, Restaurant Basics, uh, Why Guests Don't Come Back and What You Can Do About It. Uh, that's got all the... Uh, all the bad stuff in it. Oh, there's about a thousand little pet peeves and annoyances in there. There's also one that I did for servers called 50 Tips to Improve Your Tips. We talked about a couple of those, and there's certainly a lot more in there, too. So if that's something that's helpful for you, uh, just be aware of that. Key points on this, making sure that guests are happy is really the only job that we have, because if we haven't done that, none of the rest of it matters. So job one is no unhappy guests. I'll hope you also picked up an appreciation of the fact that this is a business of details. Yes, we have to do the big stuff right, but it's how we do the little things that really make a difference to the guests. Because little things add up to lower people's state of mind or to raise it. And the state of mind that people are in determines how the meal tastes to them, how much trouble or how little trouble they're going to be, how much they're going to tip, and whether they come back. So when you're out there dealing with your guests, what you want to be doing is focusing on delight. I want to make sure that you're delighted. It's, not, it's more than just giving good service, and yes, we have to give good service, but it's doing those things that they didn't expect, that just occurred to you in the moment that makes all the difference in the world.